afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you might be. I'm Steve Goldner from the CFCR. I'm part of the marketing and strategic communication team. And we have a really exciting discussion for you today. Not a webinar, we have no PowerPoint slides. I hope that rubs everyone the right way. Uh, we have a great discussion. But first, let me just give you an introduction to the CFCR, if I may. The CFCR overarching agenda is to steer the end of cannabis regulation in a safe and sensible manner. This means ending cannabis prohibition via safe and sensible pathways by working with government regulatory bodies such as the FDA, legacy cannabis providers that look to transition to the legal industry, new entrants and corporations looking to better understand their potential involvement in the budding industry, and with consumers to provide education on cannabis and potential evidence-based findings that support physical and mental health benefits. The CFCR is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. The CFCR is the voice of reason in a sea of confusion. Anyone who's been active in the legal cannabis industry recognizes a lack of collaboration between state regulators, regulators cannabis businesses, and consumers. So why is the CFCR needed and what do we do? Legalization is only half the battle without a regulatory framework. There is no federal marketplace, period. We focus the federal government and stakeholders on key issues and help them to understand each other. The legalization of cannabis in a majority of states has spurred rapid and uncontrolled industry growth. While growth represents opportunity, it also creates risk it going on check. As a result of marijuana's status of, as a Schedule I controlled substance, responsible actors in the industry continue to face disproportionate federal tax burdens, restriction on interstate commerce, and lack of access to basic and secure banking tools. In addition, Responsible companies seeking to comply with state regulatory regimes find themselves competing with non-compliant companies and bad actors taking advantage of a federal regulatory vacuum. I'm also thrilled to be uh, to have Christine De La Rosa as my co-host in this fireside chat. Christine chairs the CFCR's diversity, equity and Inclusion and Access to Capital Committee. She is the CEO and co-founder of the People's Ecosystem, which is an expansion of the People's Dispensary. Christine was named as one of 35 most influential women in cannabis in 2020, and more recently in 2021. She is the lead author of Gender Parity in the C-Suite and co-author of Pathways to Equity Ownership in the Cannabis Industry. She has advised local, state, and federal governments across the U.S. on social equity in cannabis, as well as written positioning papers for New York, California, and Arizona, with recommendations on their legalization and implementation of cannabis regulation. Christine's going to speak to you briefly about the DEA initiatives, D, excuse me, DEI initiatives uh, within this CFCR. Christine? Thank you so much. We are definitely not part of the DEA, so I want to set that straight <laughs> right now. Is that a Freudian? <laughs> no, I've, done that, I've done that a handful of times. Yeah. So it, it shows that DE, DEI is not in our head as much as it should be and should be more relevant than the DEA. So please, go ahead. <laughs> sure. Well, I'm so grateful to have all of you all here. Thank you for joining us for this very exciting fireside chat. I'm personally very excited about this. Um, but I do want to give you a little bit of heads up around what the DEI um, and Access to Capital Committee is up to. Um, one of the things that we're working on is working with the SBA to create an SBIC. Is somebody talking? Okay, sorry. I thought I, I thought somebody was talking. Um, we're, we're, we're hosting educational workshops for women and people of color. 
we're doing training and mentoring and we have a great DEI committee that's working together to create pathways for folks to join the cannabis industry. Um, so it's really kind of an awesome group of people. If you're interested in joining, please reach out to us. We're always looking for members to help us, you know, really think about what the future, future of federal um, regulation is going to look like, federal legalization is going to look like, and what the impacts on our communities are going to be on. And that's all communities, not just, you know, people of color or women. That's all communities. Cannabis touches everybody. Um, people who are sick, people who have a, a uh, chronic illnesses like I do, people that are um, veterans. So it's just super important. So if it's something that you really feel passionate about and you're like, yes, I want to make sure that we have a sensible and safe cannabis industry federally, then I urge you to join the CFCR and I urge you to join the DEI committee and the Access to Capital committee. And what we do on the Access to Capital side is making sure that we have all of the tools we need to be able to access capital now, but also when federal legalization or rescheduling happens, hopefully in the, in the next couple of years. Um, and why that's important to all of us here is that when that happens, there's a lot of more access, not only to SBA loans, not only to um, different types of uh, institutional capital, but I want you to remind you that the cat industry stands on cultivation. None of us exist without the people who actually grow the plant and do so in a loving and you know, eco-friendly way, and they will have access to agricultural subsidies. So everything kind of gets, um, is impacted by that federal legalization or rescheduling, whatever happens first. Um, so definitely, you know, you want to be on this side working before we go into it. And it's just a crazy time. We're trying to preempt that by making sure that we're talking to the federal government and making sure that they understand our needs and also some of the pitfalls they might find that they could avoid because we've already been there. So that's kind of what we do. So nice to be here with you, Steve. Thanks, Christine. And just for a little housekeeping here, everyone's mic is turned off at this point. We will open up your microphones. We will have a Q&A part of this session of the fireside chat. You can also submit questions via the chat. Um, or as I said, when we get to the Q&A with Quante, uh, just raise your hand and we will call on you. So now it's time to get to, I got to tell you, I met Quante, I think it was about four months ago, and I am truly blown away by his history, what he's done, how his mind works, and what his future is. I jokingly say so, Quante and I have met Thursdays, we get together and chat and talk about things, and I try and help him out. Um, a lot of you have heard of the book or read the book, Tuesdays with Maury. I've ha I have Thursdays with Quante, but Quante's not unfortunately dying. He's got a bright future. So I want to introduce you to this amazing human being, Quante Adams, AKA, also known as Bosco. Um, Quante grew up in Compton, California, where he was the product of his environment, his family, his friends, his neighborhood. This led him to an early life of drug dealing, arrest, and conviction. Quante was arrested and convicted of a felony charge of 35 years for attempting to possess cannabis. Not, not in his hands, attempting to possess. He'll tell us a bit about that. Um, he escaped a maximum security prison, and this Houdinian escape was covered by National Geographic in a documentary called Breakout. When he was captured, he, of course, went back to jail. Um, he fired his lawyer. He learned law, and he represented himself in front of a judge. And after 16 years of his 35-year sentence, he was released. Uh, he was released in 2020. He shared with me recently that he is officially off of probation at this point. Um, I should also mention his first mission when he got out of jail was to gain custody of his teenage daughter. He'll tell us a bit about uh, the importance of her in his life, but it was it was bugging the heck out of him in jail that he had a child out there and had no access to them. And by the way, he won full custody. So now he's free. 
And Bosco's on a mission to make sure others growing up in underprivileged neighborhoods have better opportunities than he did. Through deep soul searching, change of perception, committed action, he's able to revamp his own life and now uses the same approach to inspire, coach, and change the trajectory of others. He is the vice president and executive director of the ICANN Youth Foundation. By the way, Jim Brown, James Brown, Jim Brown, who just passed away, uh, I think it was over the weekend, was involved in this ICANN Youth Foundation as well. Quante is also the founder and the print and president of the Chasing Freedom Foundation. And what these organizations look to do, the ICANN Youth Foundation and Chasing Freedom, is to help the underserved youth through mentorship in sports. Additionally, the Chasing Freedom Foundation is focused on or also helping kids and focusing on helping bring individuals incarcerated from nonviolent drugs. Just a couple of other fascinating facts about Quante. While he was in jail, he wrote and published a book called Chasing Freedom, which is a narrative that chronicles the prominent aspects of his life through the lens of the, the dramatic escape that I talked about from a max, maximum security facility. Um, it provides an in-depth look into the conditions and the cognitions that led Bosco and many others into a web of mass incarceration. He also fun, did fundraising and is the producer for a movie that's coming out late at the end of this year. It's called Bosco. Um, once again, chronicles his life. The movie shows his escape. Uh, he met a, an older woman through a Lonely Hearts ad. The movie is directed by Nicholas Manuel Pino. It stars Thomas Jane, Vivica A. Fox, Tyrese J Gibson, and it also includes a soundtrack with original scores from Snoop Dogg and others. So to me, like, wow, what, what else can you accomplish, Quante? So let's get into Everything. it. Everything. Everything. <laughs> let's get into it and talk about this lemon to lemonade story. Quante, if first maybe you can level set us and explain what it means to grow up as an African-American male in Compton, California, what that experience is and, and who the who people were that you looked up to that led you to it, I think go for I it. think that the experience is the lack of resources when you have certain communities that are at the bottom of the list when it comes to resources from companies, government, and other people who have the ability to provide those resources. And Compton, when I grew up in Compton, it happened to be at the bottom of the list. So there was a lack of resources. Uh, mm -hmm. When you have a lack of resources, it creates poverty, it creates miseducation. And when you have all that type of social issues bottled up in a community, uh, it's pretty much set the people up and particularly the kids up for failure. So uh, that's what it's like growing up in Compton. So just imagine being limited in your resources. And that's one of the reasons why with the ICANN Youth Foundation, we try to focus on taking those kids and putting them in sports programs to where we can travel, where they can see more than what they're limited to in those communities. So if you can just so most of the people that are on this fireside chat now, really, as, as I did not, don't have an appreciation for what it is to be a young black male growing up and, and, and having dreams and, and chasing a future. You know, what was the mindset of you as a young 13 year old teenager, you know, that led you on this path? You have two set. You have two types of mindset at that time. What well, I did, deep down inside, there was the desire to, you know, to. Uh, you guys in here? One second, Quante. I think we're having some audio problems. Um, can you try yeah. that? Yeah. Okay. There we go. 
Okay, good. Yeah, I think the th the main thing is there's two two types of mindsets. You have the mindset to where me particularly, I, I wanted more in life. But then there was also the mindset to where it was hard for me to believe that there was more out there for me because I couldn't see it. And I think that's one of the biggest problems in communities like that is we're all human. We're no different than other kids. We're no different than people where you grew up, Steve. The only difference is that a lot of times we don't have the exposure, the support and the resources that other people have. And so growing up in Compton, I was kind of hopeless to agree to a degree because I couldn't, I didn't see anything that gave me that, that hope. But deep down inside, I guess it's just something about me being resilient that deep down inside, I felt that there was something out there for me. I just didn't know what it was. So tell us uh, briefly about the circumstances that led to a 35 year sentence for cannabis. This is mind boggling to me. So what happened? And then tell us a little bit about your life, ex 16 years in jail and, and a lot of that time in solitary confinement. Tell us, you know, take us to that path of, of that ugly day, if you will, or maybe, you know, like what was happening before that, that led you to an arrest. And then life moves into incarceration for Quante Adams? Well, I like to say it was trying to escape the ghetto, trying to chase freedom through the means of financial wealth. And dealing drugs, cannabis was one of the only opportunities that I had that I foresaw at accomplishing that without actually harming anyone. And so that's what I chose to do. I chose to sell marijuana and I was arrested for attempting to possess the marijuana. It was a controlled delivery reverse thing where undercover agents were attempting to deliver marijuana to me. When I went to pick it up, I got arrested. Never saw it, never touched it. And of course I was facing life without parole because as people know in federal prison, there is no parole. And at the time I found out that I had a child on the way. And Tell so my world that. was- <laughs> Tell us it. So I know that story. Not everyone tell tell how. Yeah. You so three three that. weeks three weeks three weeks earlier, my girlfriend got pregnant, and I didn't know. I didn't find out until the time of my arrest, and so there I was in prison, facing life without parole, and my child was about to enter the world. I grew up without my father. My father went to prison when I was young. I never saw him again. He ended up passing away. And so in the cell, I started doing a lot of introspection and I realized that, you know, I had failed. I was repeating that same cycle that I was so determined to break. And the only way for me to try to correct that was by escaping from prison. And that's where I started trying to escape from prison to get home to my daughter and try to change the narrative as best as I could. And tell us briefly about try one, try two, and try three of escaping. Yes, I, I tried once, cut the bars out of the cell window, got caught, placed in solitary confinement. In solitary confinement, uh, I managed to get inside the attic of, a, of the jail and found a little exhaust vent, kicked out an exhaust vent and went to crawl out and got caught out there. Uh, after that, the marshals declared me an extreme escape risk, transferred me to maximum security where they locked me in a cell 24 hours a day. Inside the cell, they had a camera in there to monitor me and make sure that I wouldn't try to escape again. I escaped and got away from there and that's when all the infamy started. So now I was known as Houdini, somebody who could break, escape from any prison. And floodgates opened up from there. Wow. Wow. Christine? Thank you so much for sharing your story with me um, and with the whole group here. Um, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about um, 
now that that's a, something that's in the past for you, as an entrepreneur, what do you see where you are and in the businesses that you are sort of spearheading um, are the opportunities for uh, entrepreneurs of color within DEI opportunities? Do you see any of those opportunities as a founder? I, I've never really given too much thought to it, to be honest, Christine. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've kind of been a bit discouraged because it seems like to me from my perception, and I don't know much about it, to be honest with you, I don't know much about it, but it seems like it's, it's you know, it's, it's kind of complicated for a lot of the, you know, well-financed uh, company and wealthy people to kind of make it in it. So it's kind of a bit discouraging for me. And I'm, I'm sure it's particularly discouraging for a lot of people from communities like our because you're talking about people who are discriminated against in this other industry, people who banks discriminate against us. It's hard for us to get loans. It's hard for us to get finance. And it's hard for us to access the resources that are available to other people. And I think from my perspective, it seems a bit discouraging to even enter. And perhaps it's designed that way. Perhaps it's they want it have us take on that mindset to think that we can't enter or compete or be successful there. But I think from my perspective, it seems a little discouraging. Yeah. Well, I do not think your perspective is incorrect. I mean, that that is also my perspective. Um, I think one of the hardest things that I've kind of noticed, especially when you're going to either whether it's capital from investors or capital from foundations or institutional capital, there is this need of the people that are um, putting out the capital. Um, they need us to perform poverty. And that's really discouraging for me, right? Like they want us to be performative. and They want to tell us what to do with the capital instead of like letting us as founders and entrepreneurs decide what's best for our own companies and how to deploy that capital. Um, it would be helpful, I think, for companies and, and, you know, tell me what you think, is that they just treated companies of color, founders of color as, you know, accomplished as we already are. I mean, look at all of the things that you have done in your lifetime, everything that you've overcome, everything that you've done for community. It should not be hard for you to get to the funds that you need, and yet it is. And then when you do get the funds, you have to fill out, you know, 72 pages of how you use the funds, which is not something that's normally asked of non-people of color companies or even foundations. Um, so I totally hear you on how that must be so discouraging. What do you do personally and as a leader in your community to overcome that discouragement so that you can continue to move forward? Like what are some of the, you know, um, some of the things that you you employ to stay positive? Well, I, I kind of, I think I look at it and I expect, no, you have to expect things to be very complicated. And when, and just taking on that mindset, it allows me to persevere and not give up. So I expect to hear no, uh 99 times out of every hundred you know so if i get one yes out of a hundred then i look at that as being successful and then you know it's about finding people i mean there are a few people out there it's hard to find that are willing to work with us and allow us like you say we do need that space because we think differently yeah we, we don't think the same and we're, we're coming from a more creative uh experience to where we're trying to be more creative we're more you know innovative if i may say when it comes to that and when you're that type of person you need that freedom to be able to do things the way that you want to do it or else it's not going to work and that could be one of the problems when people try to give you uh, resources and tell you how to use it and we keep on finding that people are failing because they're limited their creativity yeah. and innovation has been hindered yes. from that. But I, I think, think we it's always, just been... Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, I think it's, we're in a place right now in our society and in our communities where we have to train the investors, we have to train the funders 
of how to work with communities that have always had to be super innovative um, around the money because we have so little of it. We've learned to stretch our dollar so far <laughs> so that we can make sure yeah. that our, you know what, I know you know what I'm saying. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, and I think that that's your right. It's really about helping inform the, the funders on how to engage um, with folks like us, right? Yeah, and and it's, it's it's ironic you say that because when you look at the cannabis industry, I think it's something that was created by it. I think it's something that within our communities, people have been dealing cannabis and you know illegally. You know, you look at the legacy market; it's something that we know how to do it, <laughs> so yep. to speak, because it's something that we've been doing or that we've had to do. We had to be creative. We had to be competitive in an industry when it was illegal and dangerous. And we still found a way to make it work. And yep. it's like a, a, an ant has a different view from a giraffe. The giraffe can't <laughs> see what the, what the ant. We have a totally different view. We can see through little cracks. We know how to squeeze through those cracks. Yep. And they can't. And, uh, and it's with everything else. It's, it's, it's funny because everything in my life have been that way. From people told me I couldn't break out of prison. They thought I was crazy. No, I was trying to do it. I did it. People said that I couldn't write a book. I never been, dropped out of school at the age of 13, and I wrote an amazing book all by myself. People said that I couldn't fire my attorney and represent myself and get myself out of prison, that I'm crazy. I did that. Got out. Got full custody of my daughter. People thought that I couldn't do that. People said that I couldn't raise a few million dollars and produce a movie. I did that. And so I think with that track record and when you have people who are determined like that, sometimes you just got to get behind us. Because even if it's not us, perhaps it's God. Perhaps we're yeah. on this divine course. And, you know, when you have that, you have to get behind it. I totally love your sentiments and agree with you 100%. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. Back to you, Steve. Yeah, so Quante, tell us a little bit, to me, what I found once again, I keep on using the same word, mind boggling. You're in jail for 16 years. You didn't even get to meet your daughter who was born and you get out of jail and, and oh, by the way, for everyone, Quante said this many times, um, the fact that there was a child of his out there and he did not have access to that child like I think was a very strong motivator for many of the things he did while incarcerated. When you get out of jail, you meet your daughter. And by the way, folks, she graduated college this past weekend. Quante was able to go three to- Three days ago. What's that? Three days ago, four days okay. ago. <laughs> four days ago, this, yeah, yeah. So Quante was able to see that. Just an amazing accomplishment to stop the cycle that he talked about. How does one reconnect with a daughter, with society, with a new life after spending 16 years in jail? What is that like for, for you? Challenging. <laughs> it's, more, it's, it's even more difficult than escaping from prison because having it leave a prison, a place that is full of testosterone, full of aggression, full of, you know, where people are desensitized from just every emotion out there. You know, in prison, you don't, you don't entertain sensitivity. You, you know, you have to be tough. You have to overlook a lot of things that most people in society have to, have to face. And particularly when it comes to dealing with a woman, and then you're talking about a 15 year old teenager, I had to teach myself how to be more sensitive and have more empathy and more understanding. Because in prison, if somebody came to me crying about something, I'd tell them, get the fuck away from me. You know what I'm saying? But when you're dealing with a teenage girl, every little thing can, you know, can be aggravate everything can be you know irritating or uncomfortable for her and so i had to learn how to be sensitive and and train myself how to 
you know, how to cope and deal with the teenage daughter. And that was extremely complicated. But I learned a lot in the process also. So is so is being a father more challenging for you or setting, you know, where does someone go from? Yeah, of course. Of course. I think I think I think I think being a father is one of the most challenging things in the world. And it should be because it's a big responsibility. Because just imagine if I had a father like me, somebody who cared and was there to help guide me. I would be I probably would have never went to prison. Who knows? I might be a lawyer, you know what I'm saying? So I think that just having a father in the household or their present in a, in a child's life is very important. And that's something that I was willing to sacrifice everything for because that's what I, at the end of everything, at the end of life, what will you be remembered for? And if you're not remembered for being responsible for the people or the person that you brought into this world, then you failed at everything. And that's That's my belief. And that belief right there is what kept me motivated. Because if I didn't, I would probably just stay in prison and just (laughs) withered away and got caught up in the prison life. But want to be there for my child and wanting to be remembered as somebody who really cared and fought my child, that's what gave me that determination to keep persevering, and it worked out for me. Great. By the way, folks, we are going to take questions from you. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat, or in about five or eight minutes or so, we'll open it up. We can do it via hand raising. Um, But at this point, I'm going to turn it back to Christine for a minute. Thank you, Steve. So I'm not going to ask you what it feels to be like spending 16 years in prison because I'm sure it's awful and I don't want you to have to relive (laughs) that or talk about that. But it was amazing, though. It was great. (laughs) It was. (laughs) Um, But I did want to ask you, um, you know, where we are today in the cannabis community where you see large corporations. people like selling cannabis legally in many of the states that we have now, and we're looking at federal um, legalization or rescheduling or whatever they're calling it today. (laughs) I was wondering, um, what are your thoughts as somebody who was arrested and convicted for trying to accept cannabis? Like it wasn't even a cannabis really conviction. And now you see like this really big push um, where there's a lot of folks that are just out here trying to get their coin, you know, with a thing that puts you in prison. What is your thoughts around that? Do you have any suggestions for like how people can be more sensitive? Because there's still a lot of people in prison for sales and cannabis consumption. So curious to hear your thoughts. I think people should always remember that. Remember that there are still people in prison for cannabis Mm -hmm. and that there are people who whose lives have been flipped upside down because of cannabis. And I think that every last company or person involved in the cannabis industry has an obligation to reach out and support those who are suffering from the war against cannabis. Mm -hmm. That's my belief. You have organizations out there where, you know, donate to organizations that are trying to help fight, get people out of prison for cannabis, uh, reach out to people who are in prison yourself, you know, reach out mm-hmm. and just let them know that, you know, that you care about them and that, you know, you're, you're hoping and fighting to help get them out. Because when I was in there and I was saying people make millions of dollars for something that I was set to just about spend the rest of my life in prison for, it was painful. It was a hard pill to swallow and it can kind of create resentment if a person doesn't know how to check those thoughts it can start making prisoners and people suffering from it resent the cannabis industry because when you see people like for for example i met uh mary from the last prisoner project amazing person and she took me to this party where there was plenty of millionaires 
from the cannabis industry. And I was sitting in there and a guy started talking to me. He was like, it's crazy how I spent 16 years of my life in prison for something that all of these people in this room were getting rich from. Yeah, none of them were even reaching out to help people like me or people in prison. And uh, now, isn't that mind boggling? That's mind boggling to me. Totally. It is. It is. I think every cannabis company should just give me a thousand dollars, you know, <laughs> like or do give something to my community, support my foundations and support organizations that are trying to get people out of prison, like Last Prisoner Project and, you know, all the other ones that are out there, 40 Tons, Last Prisoner Projects, just all of the companies that are trying to help get people out of prison. I think people need to get behind them and support them. I totally agree with you. You know, it's very interesting. Um, you know, I'm from Oakland. And so, you know, sort of the social equity um, movement started here. And one of the things that I think has been really lost is that um, we don't, you know, they sort of started social equity with the with the business entrepreneurs, which is not necessarily bad. But to me, social equity actually starts in the prison. And I agree with you. I've had very similar experiences to you, um, uh, to you in those in those spaces where I'm like, how is this possible that this is happening? And um, and and we still have people in prison. Like everybody, and I agree with you. Everybody should be beating the drum. Every company, from the biggest MSOs to the smaller founders, should be beating the drum about getting people who are in prison currently with cannabis convictions released. And not only released, but also having that clean slate because you still had to do prohibition. You still had to do pro- probation. Pro- probation. Yeah, probation. Yeah. probation. But you still had to do probation during a time when they were legalizing cannabis. So you had that on your back, even though it was legal, especially in California where you currently are. So what are your thoughts yeah. about that? That you had to go through probation while it's legal and people are out here smoking on the street. Yep, that was that was difficult too. I mean, I I was excited to be free. I mean, and probation was like a fly on my shoulder. That was nothing, but it was definitely hindering. You know, I couldn't leave the country. I I can't. I couldn't leave the country. Couldn't even leave the state. Couldn't smoke cannabis, even though I don't. I might smoke for my first time. Whoever's willing to, you know, sponsor that, I might just smoke my first <laughs> joint. But I haven't smoked a joint in over thirty years. Uh, but yeah, it's a lot of things that probation did that just prevented me from uh, completely being free. And I just recently got off probation, what, three, four okay. weeks ago. And so I'm excited about that. Now I can you know, leave the country. I can travel something that my daughter have never done. That's something that I want to do this summer to just spend some time with her and start seeing the world. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to push it back to you, Steve. I know you have a couple more things. Yes. Yeah, so Quante and everyone, I did put, Quante's story is amazing. I did read his book. I read it in a weekend. It's a page turner. It would be great fiction, but it's nonfiction. It'd be great fiction. You know, it's not a made up story. You can uh, get his book. I put the, his URL in the chat here. But Quante, besides this story and and we could spend hours going through various aspects what is the message you want people to hear from you today i think the main thing that i want to get out there is that you can never consider us worthless and when i say us i mean people young black men who come from communities like mine uh criminal justice system said that I deserve to be in prison for the rest of my life, pretty much threw my life away. And that message resonates through our communities all across the, the world for communities like mine. And I want to be an example and to show that that's not true, that we are worth something, that we all can overcome whatever is placed before us. And with the right support and the right resources, we can be just as great and just as impactful toward humanity as anyone else. 
And so I want to be that person to kind of shed that light and give people the chance to to believe in people like me. So Beautiful. I'm living that purpose. Beautiful. Christine, you have one more question before we open it up to the audience? I actually do. I know that you touched on it, Steve, at the beginning. The content, I really wanted to do a deeper dive into your organizations, right? Because I think it's so important. And remember, this is being um, recorded. We're going to be able to post this up on our YouTubes and our socials. So if you wanted people to know, this is what my organization stands for. This is what we're doing. This is how we're impacting the community. And then I want you to end that day. And this is what we need from you. Just like you said, $1,000. I heard that $1,000 from every cannabis company. We got you. <laughs> and I'll be yeah. the first to pledge our $1,000 for you. I, <laughs> I totally believe in what you're doing. But give us some of that insight. Yeah, so particularly with the I Can Youth Foundation, we take kids from the inner city, kids who are in high school, and we bring them together and we do pick up basketball tournaments all across the country, uh, compete with other kids who play for other teams. Sometimes we even have NBA players come join us during the Drew League in 2021. We won the Drew League with Iron Oh, Vegadal. congratulations. Warriors, LeBron James played in the Drew League last year. But, you know, and then we also do mentorship for kids. Some of them don't even get involved in the sports activities, but we bring them on board and we do mentorship and we try to give them guidance. And the main thing is to give them exposure to different things so that they can see more out there. So it involves a lot of traveling. It involves taking kids all over the country and let them see different things. It involves supporting them through giving them sneakers and jerseys and, and clothing to help their confidence at school and different things like that. And what we need is we just need people to get behind us financially so that we can continue to provide this because I think this gives kids the opportunity to see more than what they've been limited to. And when we're able to see more and dream more, we're able to find out who, we're, who we are really supposed to be as a child. And that helps with the child's confidence and it gives them the determination to persevere and, and, per, and find their meaning and purpose in life. And so, yeah, just people getting behind us financially. Uh, donating. They can donate to the I Can Youth Foundation by contacting me. They can con go to our website. I'm sure we're going to leave a lot of things here. And uh, just get behind me, period. You know, a lot of my investments, you know, soundtrack, raising money for music soundtracks, film, people who are looking to get involved in that and invest and make a profit. Just all of that stuff is just helping me so that I can help my community. I love it. I love it so much. So yes, everybody heard this. You can go to the website. You can, you know, contact Ponte directly. I noticed that you have a QR code. Is that how people connect with you? Is your QR yes. code in your background? Great. Yeah. So if you have your phones out, people on this call, get that QR code and make sure that you um, reach out to Ponte and, and really support what his initiatives are. Um, super excited to have talked to you today. Is there anything else you want to add before Steve opens it up for the Q&A. No, nah, just, just I encourage people to just get behind us and support us. Let's make a difference together. So Thank you. Back addition, to you, Steve. Yeah, so in addition to that QR code, Barbara, who uh, I have to say, Barbara Gilmore has been so supportive of doing so much behind the scenes and pulling this together. She does so much for the CFCR. Thank you, Barbara. I could not have pulled this off without you a thousand times over. Barbara's going to put in the chat uh, the URL that that QR code will go to. And from there, you will see all of Quante's point of contacts when that's in the chat, if you want to copy and paste it to reach out to him, his emails there, his various social um, channels or his social handles are there. Uh, I put in there QuanteBoscoAdams.com where you can purchase his book. Uh, please follow up if you're interested to getting involved or donating to the ICANN Youth Foundation or the Chasing Freedom Foundation nonprofits that are helping people. Please do so. And with that, 
please. We've, we've had to tease you enough that you want to know more about Quante. Does anyone have any questions either in chat or via hand raising? I'm, I'm looking. Or unmute everyone and just chime in and we'll listen to you. A bashful group. <laughs> Hi there, I have a question. All right, Erin, thank you so much. Break the ice and I see Nichelle has her hand raised as well. So let's do Erin and then we'll go to Nichelle. Erin, you're muted. You'd think I'd learned by now. Hello, okay. everyone. Hi, Quante, I'm so excited to see you in person. We're connected on LinkedIn. Hey. Um, I want to uh, commend you on so many things. I don't know where to begin. First of all, I just had my last child graduate from college. God bless you. It's great. It's just yeah. such a great thing to see them fly. You know, it's fabulous. I, I'm psyched for you. Um, I just wanted to mention I'm a DC native. I have a friend there, Anthony Bell, who runs the Clifford House. He does a lot of the same things that you do. I think we should get an East Coast version of ICANN and see if we can get you some grants through the National Community Reinvestment Coalition, which my brother Ed Gorman chairs. I think there's a lot we can do together. I also have sure. done movie premieres with the, with the Congressional Black Caucus. I think this would be a heck of a fun night. We could do some fundraising, show a movie, have an event. So let's think about you know ways we can spread the word about you because I think you've got a compelling story and. Just the fact you haven't had a joint in 30 years just blows my <laughs> mind. Uh, yeah. I find that fascinating, and I, I'm sure there are a lot of reasons. Um, I, I've been about, you know, 30 minutes. No, but, I mean, that's incredible, mm -hmm. and um, your discipline is phenomenal. I, I don't want to, you know, take up a lot of time because my friend Michelle wants to say hello, too, but I just thank you for this time, and I hope we can maybe work together in the future because you're just a heck of an inspiration, sir. My hat's off. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So I'm, going to Thank take you. The, I'm going to take the action item to set up some time for Erin and Quante to speak. I will reach out to both of you. I know you're both kick ass type of people that that are do gooders. Michelle, mm -hmm. nice to meet you. Say hi to Quante. Hi, Quante. Nice to meet you. Hi. Oh, you got my book. <laughs> I, I bought your book when I was at uh, Big Singa in Miami um just last month and i was with your assistant but i somehow kept missing you and i uh, had to catch my flight before you spoke so it's <laughs> via zoom and uh thank you so much for sharing your story um i'm the founder and ceo of K coverage insurance uh we provide insurance and strategies for the cannabis um uh and i'm also in Part of our corporate social responsibility and social justice, social equity, so much so that I um, am also I also serve as the New Jersey State Director for Minorities for Medical Marijuana, and uh, we are hosting our our seventh year anniversary um, with the tri-state community: New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut. We're throwing a big event on July 27th, and would love to have you come in as our as our keynote. Um, so we should definitely con connect, and I very much agree with Erin. Uh, um, the CBC is also a fantastic resource. I attend the CBC every year, and um, I, I, I agree that um, you should be a guest speaker there as well and debut your, your movie there, your documentary. And um, there's lots of great work to, to be done, and you should be getting all sorts of grants. So yeah. it's time for, um, rewarded for the struggle that you and, and others. I concur and I appreciate that. Reach out, let's connect and I'd be happy to come speak and just come meet and, and you know, see how we can work together. Yeah, because I, I didn't get my book autographed. Oh yeah, I definitely got to come sign. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Any other questions? I don't see any hands raised or anything in the chat. Well, if there are no other questions, I really encourage you to get to know Quante. Um, 
I was introduced to him, quote, to coach and mentor him. And I can without doubt say I have learned so much more from him about life and just being what it means to have a purposeful life on the earth than I could ever return to him. And I guarantee you, as you've seen and heard him speak today, uh, if you connect with him, positive things will come into your life. I think you're on a positive, I think the pendulum has re-swung there, Quante. Oh, yeah. The ugly past is behind you and the future looks bright. You better put shades on. I know, right? <laughs> but thanks, Steve. I appreciate you, bro. Always. Anything else before we wrap this up? I see no hands. I thank you for your time. Please look into the CFCR, if you will, also. Our website is uscfcr.org. Or reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you so much for giving so much of your time today and have a great, purposeful, meaning, meaningful holiday weekend. Be well.